Einen schönen guten Abend. Hier vorne sind auch noch Stühle für all diejenigen, die da hinten so unbequem stehen. Ja, wann, wann war das letzte Mal, dass Sie einen Deepfake gesehen haben? Sie können sich nicht erinnern. Da würde ich sagen, es ist kein gutes Zeichen. Aber es kann sein, dass Sie einen gesehen haben und Sie haben es gar nicht gemerkt. Herzlich willkommen von, von meiner Seite zur äh, Veranstaltung heute Abend, gemeinsame Veranstaltung des graduierten Kolleg äh, Privacy and Trust und der Landesvertretung Hessen hier in Brüssel zum Thema Kann KI helfen, um KI zu zähmen? Hochspannendes Thema, hochspannendes Panel und wir haben auch sehr viele Teilnehmer aus dem graduierten Kolleg, was mich, was mich sehr freut, volles, volles Haus. Ähm, vorab zwei äh, Bemerkungen. Ähm, wir werden die Diskussion auf Englisch führen. Ähm, es gibt Headsets draußen am Eingang für all diejenigen, die das lieber in der verdolmetschten Fassung ähm, verfolgen wollen. Und der weitere Hinweis von meiner Seite ist, diese Veranstaltung wird aufgezeichnet und wird anschließend auf dem YouTube-Kanal der Landesvertretung Hessen äh, zu sehen sein. Also nur für Sie als, als Hinweis, wenn Sie nochmal nachschauen wollen. Aber es gibt keinen äh, Livestream. Ja, und jetzt würde ich gar nicht äh, viel Zeit vertun, äh, sondern ähm, das Wort äh, erteilen an unseren Gastgeber sozusagen, Johannes Bade, der hier ähm, die Abteilung für Forschung im Haus leitet und uns einen kurzen Vorgeschmack geben wird auf das Thema KI, Privacy Trust und Hessen. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Frau Abgeordnete Gese, sehr geehrter Herr Wierwiorowski, lieber Herr Professor Mühlhäuser, liebe Frau Wettach, dear Jeremy, dear Mr. Robinson, sehr geehrte Gäste, einen wunderschönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier in der Hessischen Landesvertretung. Ich darf Sie sehr, sehr herzlich begrüßen im Namen der Hessischen Landesregierung zu dieser Abendveranstaltung an der Schnittstelle zum Thema Künstliche Intelligenz und Datenschutz. Und ich freue mich sehr, dass wir gemeinsam mit dem graduierten Kolleg DFG aus Hessen Privatheit und Vertrauen für mobile Nutzende ähm, und mit Ihnen als Sprecher, Herr Professor Mühlhäuser, diesen Abend bestreiten können. Herzlichen Dank für all Ihr Interesse. Ja, und mit einem exzellenten Panel mit sehr, sehr großer Expertise zum Thema KI und Datenschutz und natürlich auch einem sehr, sehr interessierten Publikum mit Ihnen, ja, wirft dieser Abend seine Schatten voraus. Ich freue mich sehr auf, das, ähm, auf diesen spannenden Abend und wir freuen uns sehr, dass wir so hochrangige Gäste gewonnen haben, liebe Frau Abgeordnete Gese aus dem Europäischen Parlament, ausgewiesene Digitalexpertin Herr Wierwiorowski, europäischer Datenschutzbeauftragter und natürlich Herr Professor Mühlhäuser und ähm, Herr Rollison, Senior Director European Affairs von Microsoft. Herzlich willkommen. Und ähm, Sie haben es gesehen, Sie wissen es, die Leitfrage ist, kann KI helfen, kann künstliche Intelligenz helfen, um künstliche Intelligenz zu zähmen? Und wir sind hier wirklich an der Schnittstelle von sehr vielen spannenden Politikbereichen, Verbraucherschutz, Forschung, Innovation, Digitales, Datenschutz und natürlich auch Demokratie. Und der Zeitpunkt für diese Veranstaltung könnte besser nicht sein, denn das wesentliche Herzstück, das Gesetzesstück, der KI-Act, ist jetzt nach langen zehn Verhandlungen im Trilog auf den Weg gebracht worden. Die Datenschutzgrundverordnung, die DSGVO, wird aktuell evaluiert, teilweise evaluiert. Und das neue Mandat der Europäischen Kommission für Ende 24, Anfang 25 wirft schon jetzt seine Schatten voraus. Ja, und die neue Kommission wird garantiert einen Schwerpunkt legen auf das Thema künstliche Intelligenz und vor allem Stärkung der künstlichen Intelligenz, was die Kompetenz der Europäerinnen und Europäer betrifft. Nicht zuletzt angesichts des internationalen Wettbewerbsdrucks. Und diese notwendige höhere KI-Kompetenz in Europa bedeutet daher, dass wir unser aller Wissen und Expertise, Forschung und Innovation werden stärken müssen im Bereich KI, zum Beispiel im Forschungsrahmenprogramm Horizont Europa. 
Aber das bedeutet natürlich auch, dass wir die digitale Souveränität werden festigen müssen, die digitale Souveränität der Verbraucherinnen und Verbraucher. Denn künstliche Intelligenz, wir wissen es, kann missbraucht werden als Werkzeug zur Manipulation. Stichwort Deepfakes in Bild, in Text, in Ton und das natürlich besonders im Vorfeld von Wahlen, wie den Europawahlen. Ja, und die Frage ist daher, wie schaffen wir es, dass wir ein ja, immer komplexeres KI-Umfeld, ein immer komplexeres KI-System besser verstehen. Und hierzu passt ein Eindruck des TÜV-Verbandes, der eine Umfrage in Deutschland durchgeführt hat, von Mai ähm, 23 bis Januar 24. Und diese Umfrage zeigt wirklich sehr, sehr plastisch die gesellschaftlichen Herausforderungen auf im Bereich künstliche Intelligenz. 80 Prozent der in Deutschland Befragten meinten, dass es mit Blick auf künstliche Intelligenz unabschätzbare Risiken gebe. Und 61 Prozent äußerten, sie, hätte die, sie hätten die Sorge, künstliche Intelligenz könne sie ohne ihr Wissen manipulieren. 65 Prozent sorgten sich, die Technologie sei für den Menschen schlicht und einfach nicht kontrollierbar. Und die Mehrheit der Befragten gab sogar an, ja, KI stelle eine richtige Gefahr dar, für die Demokratie. Und das sind, meine Damen und Herren, wirklich sehr, sehr besorgniserregende Zahlen für die künstliche Intelligenz, für das Image von KI. Jetzt könnten wir natürlich aber auch die Sache ganz anders sehen und sagen, trotz dieser thematisierten Gefahren bietet KI die Chance, ja einen völlig neuen Blick, einen frischen Blick zu werfen auf die Angelegenheit, wenn wir nämlich den Stier bei den Hörnern packen und sagen, KI stellt eine Chance dar, könnte das ja heißen als Frage, brauchen wir künstliche Intelligenz, um künstliche Intelligenz zu steuern, um künstliche Intelligenz auch abzuwehren. Und darauf aufbauend, was bedeutet all dies für das Mandat der Europäischen Kommission ab Ende 24, ab Anfang 25? Ja, und für all diese Fragen bringen wir relevante Expertise für Sie aus Hessen mit, nämlich ein 40-köpfiges ähm, interdisziplinäres Expertengremium aus dem DFG-Graduierten-Kolleg und zwar tagt dieses Gremium bei uns, Herr Professor Mühlhäuser, mit ihrer ganzen Expertise, und zwar ähm, von drei Universitäten geprägt, Frankfurt, Darmstadt und Kassel. Ich freue mich, dass diese Expertise hier heute Abend einfließt. Und äh, Stichwort Hessen, lassen Sie mich einige Worte gerne zu Hessen sagen. Hessen ist tatsächlich einer der Top-Hotspots in Deutschland und sogar europaweit für KI-Forschung. Und die neue hessische Landesregierung die Mitte Januar ihr Mandat begonnen hat, hat ein besonderes Augenmerk gelegt auf das Thema KI-Forschung und Stärkung des KI-Standortes Hessen. Und die Landesregierung wird weiterhin KI an Schnittstelle zwischen Forschung und Anwendung weiter fördern und insbesondere Hessen AI stärken, um das hessische KI-Innovationsökosystem voranzubringen. Ja, und Hessen AI, das ist das hessische Zentrum für künstliche Intelligenz und das kombiniert ein progressives, ein wettbewerbsfähiges Forschungsprofil mit einer zukunftsgerichteten Forschungsagenda. Und das wissenschaftliche Leitziel unseres KI-Zentrums ist es, die dritte Welle der KI zu etablieren. Das heißt, neuartige KI-Systeme, die über menschenähnliche Denkfähigkeiten verfügen. Und dieses Zentrum Hessian AI hebt die Spitzenforschung auf ein neues Level. Und dabei machen wir nicht Halt, denn Hessian AI transferiert das Wissen, die Expertise auch hin zu Wirtschaft und Gesellschaft. Ja, und wir basieren unsere Arbeit da auf 13 Hochschulen, 22 neue KI-Professuren und 38 Millionen Euro Förderung des Landes Hessen für dieses Zentrum. Und hier haben wir einiges vorzuweisen. Hessian AI verfügt über ein KI-Innovationslabor, zudem über ein Startup-Gründungszentrum, AI Startup Rising, und last but not least über exzellente KI-Recheninfrastruktur. Das heißt, Hessen weist ein exzellentes KI-Ökosystem auf. Und hier werden wir auch noch weiterhin Forschende und Anwenderinnen und Anwender ja, exzellente Talente nach Hessen anziehen. Ja, Stichwort Exzellenz, das ist ja ein Thema, was für die Europäische Kommission auch sehr, sehr wichtig ist, zum Beispiel im Forschungsrahmenprogramm Horizont Europa. Und auch hier war Hessian AI in den letzten Monaten und Jahren sehr, sehr erfolgreich. Und zwar haben wir elf ERC-Grants, die wirklich sehr, sehr renommiert sind, eingeworben. Ja, in puncto Spitzenforschung schreitet Hessen voran und auch in der nationalen Forschungsarena 
Hier lief ja in Deutschland die erste Phase der Exzellenzclusterausschreibung und auch hier hat Hessen sehr gut performt, nämlich fünf ähm, Exzellenzcluster sind in die zweite Ausschreibungsrunde gekommen und davon widmen sich zwei dem Thema künstliche Intelligenz. Das sind die Projekte Adaptive Mind und Reasonable Artificial Intelligence. Bei Adaptive Mind geht es darum, grundlegende Prozesse der menschlichen Wahrnehmung, des Denkens, des Verhaltens zu verstehen, um sich an ständig wechselnde Kontexte anzupassen. Und Reasonable Artificial Intelligence, für diesen Abend und die Diskussion auch sehr, sehr interessant, arbeitet daran, die nächste Generation von KI-Systemen zu entwickeln. Denn aktuelle KI-Systeme, wir wissen es, die weisen auch große Schwächen auf, wie zum Beispiel fehlende Logik, fehlende Anpassungsmöglichkeiten und Situationen. Und diese nächste Generation der KI-Systeme wird daran arbeiten, mit einer vernünftigen Menge an Ressourcen umzugehen, basierend auf verantwortungsvollem Datenschutz, basierend auf ethischen Standards. Womit wir just in medias res wären, bei dem Thema des heutigen Abends, und ähm, insofern ja, darf ich Ihnen allen schon mal für Ihr Interesse danken und ich danke besonders Herrn Professor Mühlhäuser für die ganze Expertise, die hier einfließen wird. Ich danke dem Panel und auch organisatorisch Frau Bertha von der Technischen Universität Darmstadt und last but not least allen Kolleginnen und Kollegen der Landesvertretung, die den Abend erst möglich gemacht haben. Dazu zählt insbesondere Herr Gulaschinski, Herr Schulz, aber auch Frau Schrauben, Herrn Fernane und unseren Praktikanten. Ich danke Ihnen sehr herzlich und ich darf jetzt übergeben an Herrn Professor Mühlhäuser vom DFG gratulierten Kolleg. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much, Mr. Bade, for this uh, very elaborate introduction. I'm switching to English um, just in preparation of our panel that will be held in English. Um, yeah, I'm representing the um, hosting institution, but our host is, of course, the representation here. Why are we here and uh, not at a different uh, representation? Simply because three Hessian universities um, are joining in this endeavor that we are celebrating tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, um, our graduate college on privacy and trust for mobile users, where about 40 to 50, changing size, um, 40 to 50 researchers, professors, uh, PhD candidates, postdocs, um, scientists of all sorts, um, have joined from five disciplines, namely sociology, uh, psychology, economics, the laws, and computer science um, to do research on privacy and trust for mobile users. Um, we did this for more than eight years now and are still in the process of uh, doing this kind of research. And um, with that, of course, we got involved a lot in AI, for instance, um, trying to um, find out how AI can um, learn on uh, personal data, on, on personally identifiable inter information without leaking that information um, to uh, in an unwanted manner. Um, many have probably heard about federated learning, a big um, attempt to do that, um, but you know, some of our research identified attack vectors on federated learning and found ways to mitigate them. So AI is, since a long time, uh, definitely an issue and a topic that we are dealing with. Now, um, as the opening event tonight for this, um, for this um, uh, big, um, how should I call that, roadshow showcase of our, um, of our scientific cooperation, we thought we'd not look back, uh, that's what we are going to do in the next two days, looking back at our achievements over the last eight years. Um, tonight we want to look forward and uh, address a very timely topic. And indeed I can uh, say I have a, a PhD thesis on my desk uh, from a, um, that, that was supervised by a very famous uh, colleague from Italy. And a very, very smart PhD student wrote a thesis about manipulation um, in 
uh, online social networks and had a particular focus on, for instance, the Italian elections in 2022. And it's really frightening to see how much um, AI-based software um, is, is perceived by people in social networks as a peer that they are talking to, but they are not talking to a human being, they are talking to software. And there are thousands and thousands of these chat bots that gradually move people's opinion uh, from a more democratic, more liberal opinion, gradually to a more and more radical opinion. And maybe many of you have thought about what's going on with our democracy, what's going on uh, in the elections that we are facing, how come um, so, so rapidly opinions are changing and we see misinformation, disinformation, destabilization, we see more and more radical uh, activities and, and um, I think many of us get frightened about this and definitely AI plays a role in all this. Now, I'm of course a computer scientist, so I'm, I'm positive about AI, definitely. It, it, we need it for many, many things that will um, determine the wealth of our industry, of our nations in the future. So I'm not against AI at all, but there are definitely threats. And tonight we have a wonderful panel that can talk about that. And actually, um, if you look at privacy, privacy tries to protect from um, all kinds of digital services and software uh, having too much insights into us. Now, AI, of course, is a wonderful tool for providing more and more insights about what people need, what they want. So you can build customized medicine, you can build customized uh, fitness uh, apps and all kinds of, of uh, very personalized and, and adequate and, and smart tools. But of course, you can also use this information for bad purposes. You can use it to understand how people think, what the best arguments are, and then, and then AI closes the loop, and that's the topic for tonight, that AI closes is the loop to first understand our thinking and then to manipulate us in, in the best possible way uh, towards goals that, you know, some uh, radical parties or some radical uh, governments um, might impose. And that's something that we have all together um, raised awareness about and um, think about what we can do. And I'm so glad that we have representatives from industry and forefront industry. Microsoft, as most of you uh, probably know, um, is very much engaged, has a big uh, share in open AI and in um, very forefront AI tools. So the question will be, um, can AI tools help us to mitigate the threat of manipulation, disinformation, um, and of uh, radicalization and destabilization? Um, we have a member of parliament. I'm very glad to have uh, Ms. Gese here, um, member of the European Parliament. The question will be, what about legislation? What are the means that we can take uh, from that perspective? Um, we have the data protection officer of the EU. I'm very, very glad to have you here. And um, we'll also discuss what the institutions, what the commission, what uh, different um, institutions on the EU and, and national level um, can do to help us. We'll definitely have to talk about education and similar things. And it's an open discussion and that's why we are going to invite you in the end to um, you know, help us with your comments, with your questions, but also maybe um, with your proposals on um, where we should put an emphasis to you know, um, start and, and uh, really uh, win that struggle um, against, um, you know, uh, basically um, losing our freedom and our democracy. It's really a core topic and uh, a topic of primary interest. And I'm very glad to have you all here, and I'm really excited now to see what's going on in our panel. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Um, I was thinking, I was trying to talk to my bank this morning and I was really desperate and I would have much preferred to talk to a bot. And this doesn't happen very often and I think it was actually a very pleasant thing to have this experience this morning because I've read so much about all the negative aspects of AI. And, and this morning I thought, well, but we do need it after all. Um, I would like to invite my panelists to join me up here for, uh, for our debate. Alexandra Geyser, you, you're um, a vice president of the Greens. You've been heavily involved in, in digital uh, legislation in the past five years. Um, I'm wondering, how big a threat is AI? Well, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for the question. I'm, I was afraid of that question because it forces me to give a sort of dystopian answer, which is a little bit my fate. I would like to speak about the positive things that AI can do in medicine, in research, in industry, in uh, combating climate change. I mean, there's so many positive things that can be said about AI. I have to start on the dystopian ones. Um, it, it is extremely dangerous. Um, I think Professor Mühlhäuser, where are you here? Uh, just mentioned it. Um, uh, the example of Italy, I think, is, is striking. I've lived in Italy for, I lived in Italy for 20 years, so I'm very sympathetic to, to that case. Um, there, is, there is the combination of um, recommender systems, um, chatbots, AI, and this is all in some way AI-based. It depends a little bit on how you define AI. You probably know that you can spend days and months about, uh, about the definition of what artificial intelligence actually is, but if we say it's really highly automated, um, self-learning, self-optimizing software systems, when it comes to social networks, you have recommender systems. So it's basically the software systems that decide what people see in their timelines. And the way they work right now is um, that usually they disseminate polarizing messages a lot more than any other kind of messages. And that in democracy means hateful speech, it means misinformation, disinformation, and it means extremist political messages, so everything that elicits anger and fear, because this is unfortunately which keeps us, what keeps us hooked to platforms. And this is well now, it happens in very different ways, but more or less on all social networks, on all platforms. If you combine this with generative AI, so the possibility to generate text and images, and now videos, and audios at practically no cost and at very high speed, you can understand that it's so much cheaper and so much quicker to create a piece of disinformation than a piece of information that requires qualified journalists doing the research, talking to people, and so on. So there's just no way that truthful information and, and quality journalism can outperform mis- and disinformation because of these two uh, two mechanisms, and this is something we are facing right now. We have seen this, for example, in the Slovak elections as well. We have examples from all elections, also from Germany. Um, and yeah, and this is what the Commission, European Commission is actually working on, trying to keep the European election safe, but I, I can assure you it is not an easy task. And it's also interesting because it's not just about elections. I read that in Paris, people are really worried about the Olympics and, and misinformation around the Olympics. Apparently, the bed bugs were invented to destabilize people about, you know, about, about France. So, I mean, it's, it's even bigger than, than uh, we think. Absolutely, we have, we have bad actors um, that are using these tools, different kinds of actors, and the one you mentioned, the bad box story I read, it was, it, it's a Russian influence campaign, basically, so we have really this, this foreign influence campaigns that have disinformation as one very important element and that are successfully, in some cases, trying to manipulate uh, public opinion. I think we, we do stand a chance. I mean, there was, there was an article that came out lately that really tries to analyze what disinformation does, especially government um, created disinformation. And it says, well, in autocracies, it uh, makes it very difficult for the opposition to, uh, to topple the system. So it basically uh, supports the, the autocrat. In democracies, it's a little bit less clear because on the one hand, it 
um, it uh, fuels polarization and f polarization fuels autocratization. Sorry for all these complicated terms, but it favors autocracies. But on the other hand, there might be a reaction in some countries. There are strong reactions by people who recognize this, this, uh, this effort, who recognize the disinformation, who recognize the influence campaigns and really protest against that and fight for their democracy. So it's not clear yet where, where the effect is, but it's a danger. And I think we need to be alert and face it and create the instruments to combat it. Wojciech, we're delighted to have you here. Wojciech Wiborowski, you are the European Data Supervisor. You've got a very, very long career in, um, in, um, uh, in, in, in data uh, supervision, but we learned earlier that you actually started your career as a data miner, so you've seen the dark side of all of this. And I'm sorry to be so negative, but I'm going to ask all of you how big a threat are we actually facing? Because I think it's very important to uh, to start the debate just looking at the size of the challenge. So I will probably surprise you saying that I don't see this uh, danger that is created by the artificial intelligence as something very unique as something which just happened in this uh, generation and it didn't exist before. Uh, sorry to say, but uh, the elections were usually about manipulation, were usually about making the people believe that what I say is right. And uh, those who may probably follow me, may probably follow me because they have more or less the same uh, look to view to the world, but also to find those who are actually quite far away from my view to the world, but who may, for whom the uh, slogans, the, the, uh, even the program of my party may be uh, appealing. So this is not that uh, incredibly new. This is something which is accelerating. Uh, that's true that the, the polarization is the uh, problem, but once again, that's not the first time that is a problem for the democracy. Let's look back. Uh, let's look back to the to all the democracies, uh, which actually were going through the through the uh, moment like that. You told me that uh, you, you told that I started my work as a data miner, so I saw the dark side. The funny thing is that I never thought that it is dark. It was fun. <laughs> I was 26. I have been given the uh, tools, uh, which I never had in my hand. And uh, as a lawyer in 1996, as you, you can imagine, the, the, the IT was not for lawyers. Yeah? I had the first email account in my university, uh, being a student of the second year. So all these things were new for me. All, the, all these tools were great. And uh, being working in a company which was providing lawyers with the software, the company that just invented that profiling the clients might be the next interesting uh, addition to the, to the program, well, we didn't have the data protection law at this time. And only when the data protection law came in 1998, I found out that something which I thought is probably not 100% ethical might be even illegal. Yeah? So that, that would be one thing which I would like to stress. Uh, ethics is incredibly important. But when the lawyer starts to talk about ethics, saying that that's an ethical issue, and it should be discussed by the, uh, by the specialist in ethics, it means that he doesn't know what to do. Because he is a lawyer and he should think about the legal uh, advice. The same is, uh, the same is uh, with, about education. We all should agree that education is the most important. Yes, it is. But once again, if somebody says that's a matter of education, it means he doesn't know what to say. Well, I would, su I would uh, uh, supplement it with one sentence. If education and if ethics, that's not education for them and ethics for them, this is for us. I mean, we have to educate ourselves. We have to think about our own ethics. Thank you very much. I think you made two very important points. You said this is not totally new. I think we can now discuss, but isn't the size you know, so much different from what we have seen before? And I really like the point you made about this is fun. 
it's hard to stop things that are fun. It's harder, much harder to stop things that, that, that are fun. Um, Jeremy Rollison from, from Microsoft, how, how, how do you see the challenge? H how big is the threat? Well, thank you. I can't say that I haven't had time to think about it. It's been the title, and I've heard a lot that I actually agree with. I think, I hope that, at least in the way that we've engaged in this space, we don't want to minimize the risks of this technology. I think it was said earlier, there are bad actors who most certainly can, do, and will misuse these tools. And in fact, that can lead to very dangerous outcomes, uh, particularly, and it seems like we're talking much in the deep fake and disinformation context right now, it's certainly prominent ahead of these elections where we were discussing this earlier. I, I, I do think the way you calculate it, more people are voting this year than ever before, in fact. Um, it's a timely discussion today ahead of these elections, but also a few weeks ago at the Munich Security Conference, uh, Microsoft, along with 19 other companies, um, recognized some of this threat and are trying to take a first step towards doing something about this, which was a tech accord to combat the deceptive use of AI in elections. It was really a deep fake problem, particularly in the audiovisual um, side of things. Uh, but it's only a first step, and we've already seen even internally, but in the US, in Europe, and elsewhere, the way that these can be misused. And these are powerful tools. Now, as an AI company, you know, we're excited about this technology. You know, I, am, I have to be more optimistic than pessimistic, but we're not minimizing the risks. Um, we've seen it firsthand. We've seen ways that these tools now can, you can use my voice in a different language and make a speech on that. You know, that has been done in an electoral context. We've seen Obama, I mean, we've seen, seen Biden, we've seen all over the place. And you'll see more of it, unfortunately, I'm afraid. Um, but what we can do as an industry is some of these steps we've announced recently, there are ways, even leveraging some of the AI tools, uh, whether it's watermarking, it's content provenance, it's transparency requirements, it's not one measure that's going to adjust all of this, and it's not only measures that tech companies can take. We're going to talk about that yeah. later. So. so I think the threat is big. Um, I don't want to minimize it, but we are, I don't want to be the most pessimistic person on this panel either. I should be the most optimistic. Um, <laughs> I think we're very optimistic about the way that AI can also mitigate this. You'll hear it perhaps later, the idea that this is a bit of a cat and mouse game at some times, you know, the bad guys will innovate as well. But I think it's a back and forth and we're still more optimistic about what AI can do to combat this, but definitely, definitely don't want to minimize the risks. So now the big question is, who's going to be the most pessimistic <laughs> on the panel? You, you've been looking at this for years, so what's your view? Well, I, I tend to be very pessimistic in order to derive the solutions from there. But uh, since I'm into solutions, uh, I think uh, the pessimism is, is quite mitigating. Um, I, would, I would like to return to some of the things that were said. Um, number one, ethics, education, uh, you know, um, of course, Ethical questions are, are very high level. The question is, um, do we have a chance to consider manipulation, destabilization, a criminal act? Um, can we get a handle on that so that we can um, find out where the criminal act starts and where a campaign, uh, you know, a political campa campaign, a, you know, exchange of, of opinions, um, stops and, and, and where it starts to become criminal. Can we establish something like that so that from the legal perspective, from law enforcement perspective, from the perspective of a crim a criminal law, we can act against these things? That, that would be one issue. Talking about education, uh, yes, we have to educate ourselves and we know that the reach of education is, is limited. Um, for instance, when uh, people have already radicalized, it's very hard to, you know, uh, bring them back to normal thought, you know. But there are, of course, people at the fringes that, that are currently about to be sucked into uh, these radical opinions where you still have a chance. But then, um, you know, yes, we had all this before, but the power of software is that you can replicate it at almost zero cost. So you can have thousands and thousands of, of chatbots, you know, and if you try to do the same thing with, with human power, you're doomed, right? So um, definitely part of the answer 
has to be AI. And AI has already shown that it um, has a big handle in, in, in on the defense side, you know, with cybersecurity, for instance, uh, where intrusion detection and, and other means are AI driven. Uh, we have seen, um, you know, deep fakes or fake images being detected by AI and so on. Um, and I have a colleague, for instance, uh, in, in natural language processing, she's working on enabling chatbots to find, um, you know, manipulative arguments and to counter them with well-researched, well-founded um, counter-arguments, which is, of course, a big research effort. And now we are at the key question, how much are we willing to invest in this to join forces, uh, you know, to set up large programs because um, there's a lot of money uh, involved in this and uh, are we willing to spend the same amounts of money? I, I think we, we see a, a very similar question now with the Ukrainian war and the stats that we have. You know, there's one, one thing is to talk about a new era, a Zeitenwende, but the other thing is, you know, to put money aside and to, to really uh, do a joint effort uh, to counter that, and and this is to me totally unclear. Now comes the pessimist again. Um, I don't see this big movement yet, and I'm I'm very glad that at the Munich conference there were 19 companies starting really to to get together and 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 uh, start a joint effort. But that's where I see the big issue. How can we actually maximize the benefits? So that's your chance to talk about positive things, and. Um, at the same time, minimize minimize the risks. And, and I'm kind of wondering, can we even distinguish between good and bad AI? Isn't that ever like, like human beings, like we're all a bit good and a bit bad? Uh, well, yes, certainly. Um, but there are technologies that enable certain behaviors more than others. So I don't think technology is neutral, but artificial intelligence, it's, it's not a name of a, it's not a definition of a technology. It's a very broad spectrum of different technologies that involve great amounts of data basically and of processing capacity. So it's, it's a very vast definition. So definitely you can't say it's good or bad. Um, I already mentioned, I think I see really, really enormous opportunities in, in medicine, um, in production technology, in combating climate change. Um, for example, energy grids will, will need artificial intelligence for, for the energy. Um, you know, switching from having one coal plant or one nuclear plant to having many solar plants, many, many windmills. It, it requires completely different management of the grid. Though it's super important. I mean, there's so many areas. Um, the, the, where it gets complicated is really where AI technologies are used to basically classify people. Uh, for example, recruiting is a case in point, um, credit worthiness, um, so there's some social systems, social benefits that use AI with disastrous consequences on the people who are victims of this. And not, you know, not in Australia or in the US, um, close here in the Netherlands. Um, uh, so I think the, the European Union did a good thing with the AI Act um, because we have these different risk classes um, and we look at the different applications of AI, what can they do, and we look at areas where it's more dangerous to use AI than others, and so there are different obligations. I don't think it's really you know, the last word, it's, it's a very dynamic technology. And it's true that there always have been new technologies, but I, I saw that the numbers, I can't, I can't retain numbers, but on the rollout of this, of, of GPT, um, and I, I saw that there's never, you know, it took Facebook, I don't know how many years to get up to a billion users, and ChatGPT was just broke every, every, every single record. And that is what makes it so dangerous. To come back a little bit to the democracy issue that is not covered in the AI Act because there was a clear choice in terms of legal certainty not to cover the same kind of technical system from two different, with two different pieces of legislation, the AI Act, because we also have the Digital Services Act. And 
I think the Digital Services Act is really interesting because um, it's, it's a little bit abstract to read, so it's, it's very difficult to explain to people when they ask, well, what does the Digital Services Act do against hateful speech, against polarization, against fake AI, and you have to start, well, there are the risk assessments, and then the commission can take measures, and we can look at the data, and people go, well, that's not a real measure. But yes, it is, because it means that that piece of legislation is dynamic enough to investigate specific dangers and what it can do with the risk assessments, it does ask the, the, the platforms to assess the risk, the risk of their, not their technology, of their business model, of the design, of the recommender systems, their advertising systems, for a series of risks, fundamental rights, data protection, but also um, violence against women, which is a huge issue in this context. Um, the protection of children, but also public discourse and elections. And then the commission can take measures to m mitigate that, so the companies are asked to take measures to mitigate those risks, but the commission can also um, make those measures mandatory. And that's a very flexible instrument to react to new challenges, because we know the challenges are uh, changing very quickly. Well, chatbots, there has been a discussion for years if that's a big issue or not, because they're so difficult to find. Um, and now it's, it's, it's AI, for example, and so we have that piece of legislation that adapts to, to the technical challenges, and I think that's very positive. The problem is that obviously enforcement is lagging behind. You know, the commission, I was, I was just in an event where, where we discussed that, and the commission now has 120 people to enforce the DSA, recruiting other 50. They're setting up capacities for the AI Act as well. They said, well, Google has something like 1,400 lawyers. <laughs> so uh, this is really a societal effort. We need, we need research organizations, universities. We need the national enforcement agencies. We need civil society organizations with their ideas to really come in and build this big network contributing to the knowledge and also to the debate about what do we want AI to do? You know, when you talk about fake images, uh, you can say, well, you, you just want to ban it and then we won't see the Pope with the, with the Balenciaga jacket. But there's so much fun content, you don't want to ban that. But you need to be sure uh, that, uh, for example, a fake porn video of a candidate for the elections, which is something that happens to women very, very regularly, and it's really a big threat, doesn't go viral, and you need to make sure, and in order for that not to go viral, you need to take it down within minutes, not within hours, within minutes. So how can we make that sure? And I think we need a lot of public debate. So when we talk about education, it's not so much, <clears throat> often people think, well, you have to teach people to recognize if a piece of content is true or not. I think that's, that's not gonna happen anymore because AI tools will become so powerful that nobody can do that. And even if you can, you know, the image is stuck in your brain, even if you know it's false. Um, but we do, what we do need to do is to understand how these mechanisms work, how do social networks work, what's, what are algorithms optimized for, why do they show me certain content, and the same thing on AI, what kind of data is used, what is the modeling like, what is it optimizing for, how, how does the technology work, and then have a really common debate about what we want and what we don't want, and that's just the start of a long process. Wait a same question to you, and I hope you're gonna, we're gonna get a dose of optimism again. So how do we maximize benefits and minimize threats? Maybe the, well, with the threat's not that big, maybe, maybe that helps already with your answers. Well, I, I think that the approach uh, that uh, the uh, legislator took in the Artificial Intelligence Act uh, itself is very good. The, 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 the uh, focus on assessment, uh, on self-assessment, uh, is an important starting point. Uh, you said about uh, the uh, your friend who is uh, uh, preparing the software, artificial intelligence software, to find manipulation. And I would say that's one of the softwares that we have to assess if this is a high risk as well. Because probably there's a high risk, uh, uh, the very good example of the high risk system, which tries to find the other artificial intelligence ma manipulations. I, I just have in my hand the article from yesterday. Is an AI system detecting text generated chat GPT for, uh, for, for universities a high risk uh, AI, AI system itself? So we have something like a wheel. Uh, in fact, we have to assess the tools that we will use the AI tools uh, that we use 
to find the AI man manipulation the same way as we do it with the manipulating ones. So uh, how to close this gap? Definitely to think uh, about the possibility of misuse of AI in all the situations when we tr try to cr create uh, some new solutions. And neither the fact that this is done by the charity, neither the fact that it is done by this small and medium enterprise, nor the fact that it is done by the academic, uh, says that it will be the good solution and it will be the solutions which will not manipulate uh, the result itself. Jeremy, I'm more interested in the second part of the question, how do we minimize threats? Because you were gonna talk about that earlier. So what, what are you doing? What are you doing like, yeah, there's not There's not one thing that we have to do. I mean, Orchip mentioned earlier education, which I think is actually one of the most important parts about this. And we might not get to the point where you can educate people how to determine whether something's fake or not, but I think we can at least educate people that you should be wondering whether something's fake or not. You know, and that might seem a bit negative, but I do think we need to constantly emphasize some of that because it gets into very gray areas. But education's only one part. What we can do as companies are some of the things we've announced already and things we're gonna have to continue to announce as we innovate in that space. So if you think about the obligation we have as a tool provider, you know, how are we preventing the misuse of those tools? What type of programming can you put in place and protocols to prevent the deep fakes in a porn context, or whether an artist doesn't want the possibility for their works to be recreated in that style. They should have a right to be able to re be removed from those systems. Um, we're constantly learning about the ways that people are using that. So once again, we're gonna make mistakes, I think. We're not gonna be perfect off the bat. We are gonna have to develop more tools that you can do with the content watermarking type initiative we've already been a part of, and that's gonna continue to evolve, where whether baked into the metadata or even the watermarking that using systems that can determine whether this was generated by an AI system or not. And it's also gonna have to be roles that governments take on. Um, it's something that we're working a lot with civil society and NGOs to kind of feed back in as to how effective these tools and measures are. But it's not something that tech companies alone can do, and it's not one measure that tech companies can take. If you think about the difference between the obligations and some of that accord that I mentioned earlier reflects this, as a tool provider, we have some obligations. But when you think of the platforms that can disseminate this, what obligations do they have as well? So I don't think it's one measure. I think it's gonna to continue to be a space that we have to innovate, but I think it starts with some of the watermarking, if you wanna get very concrete about it. I think it starts with some of the um, use, in terms of use, that we have to bake into this and just continue to see how this evolves and how the bad guys innovate as well and hopefully stay one step ahead. Maximum has a, um, do we for education? Um, also, is, is AI really the best weapon against AI threats? Mm. Let me first answer to, to the questions about education. Um, I, I think you, Jeremy, said something very important. Um, there is a minimum of, of education that, that we can master for probably anyone, you know? Um, and that would be to uh, re-establish more credit and credible in institutions. So it's a matter of trust in the end, you know. And um, institutions like, you know, public press, um, public TV and radio stations um, are losing credibility and, and it's, it's really deliberately, deliberately eroded by, you know, some, some uh, negative forces. And, um, how do we do that? As a journalist, I, I'd, I'd love to hear, how do we actually do it? You know, when I write about, about a right-wing party, I get really nasty emails, and people well, are really trying to, to shut me down. So how could we, you know, in very uh, concrete... Again, this is a so societal and, and joint effort. I think uh, journalists have to, you know, really um, set up some, some standards that at least those who believe in those standards should adhere to and subscribe to. Um, we should do the minimal education, which is that there are trustworthy institutions, you know, not perfect, but trustworthy. And um, of course, we, we should strengthen those, you know. If, if you think of the fact that in some elections in, in German states, it is clear that if the radical party wins first act, they will uh, enable is, is to cancel the contract about um, public uh, TV stations, you know, that, that's going to be their first 
uh, thing to do, you know. So, um, and, and I think, as, as you said, we cannot imagine that um, individuals will be clearly uh, discerning fake from, from, from real um, photographs or, you know, uh, manipulation stuff, but if there are credible institutions, they can help a lot. You know, and, and in order to strengthen them, I think we need a joint effort, definitely. Um, so, um, what was your other my, my second question is moving on, is, is AI really the best weapon against AI threats? I mean, it's been, it's been mentioned, it's actually quite complicated to use it, it but, but what's your view on it? Uh, on it? Um, okay, I, I'm, I'm interesting, interested to hear other opinions also um, from, the pub, from, from um, our uh, um, auditory from, from you, um, I think it's definitely part of the solution, definitely part of the solution. And it has already shown um, to be very valuable, you know, in, in the cyber security arena, but also in this uh, fake, um, you know, deep fake arena, et cetera, et cetera. So it's definitely part of the solution, but it's definitely also not the only solution. And and of course, if, if this weapon and if this weapon is to be strong, it requires a lot of investment. Yeah, <laughs> and is it a crucial? Is it a crucial part of the solution? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Would you agree? And then we need to talk about money, resources, <laughs> <laughs> investment. <laughs> Um, well, I, I would stress rather another aspect. The question is who controls it, mm -hmm. and how do we know what's in it? You know, it's it's an instrument. It's like it's like taking a knife uh, to cut something, and everybody can take it. But a knife is very easy to see. You see how long it is, how sharp it is, who made it, and um, it can fall into the hands of bad actors who use it to stab people, and it can fall into the hands of people who use it to cook and feed people. Um, so the question is rather, how do we know um, what's in it? What is it made of? What is the data that goes in it? Who did the modeling? Um, what is it optimized for? And to have some control or some transparency as society about how AI instruments work, I think that is, that is the decisive point. I mean, in cybersecurity, you don't want everybody to know how your AI, AI, AI works, but I think the enforcement agencies using it needs to know that and shouldn't just buy it from a company, but has their own experts um, who understand that tool really profoundly. And that is about money. It's, for example, it's not about, about buying the most expensive or the most powerful tool. It's having public authorities and a public bureaucracy where people are educated enough and have the time to learn this that are experts and who know actually what they're doing with their, with their AI tools. I think that is also the kind of investment when we speak about, in, uh, about education. It's not so much saying, well, every kid needs to co learn to code in school. It's about having a public, um, uh, public infrastructure where, where people, where, there, where we have experts who know how to use this, these tools, for example. I think that is, that is super important. Um. S same question. Is it? Can it be a crucial uh, tool? Would you would you agree with Max? Or I mean, from what you said, you, you already said it's it's a difficult tool to use. Yes, it is. But uh, uh, I'm absolutely sure that this is a part of the solution and the big part of the solution. And once again, the, the historical examples show that uh, uh, when we have the possibility to make the the automatization of some process, we do that. Yeah, the, the, this is how how the uh, human being uh, is. Uh, actually programmed itself. Uh, we try to do the things automatic way. If you go to the, to, the, to, to the car garage right now, you are connecting the car to the computer and you are getting the first assessment uh, of what happened uh, or, or even some adjustments, yes? And uh, we only trust that this uh, uh, software that was used, this hardware that was used, uh, is the one that we, can, uh, that we can rely. And this is an important part of the story. Of course, I know that you can you can think that I'm saying uh, about it as the regulator, as somebody who is supposed to do such a check, yeah? But this is why I fly this, the, the, the planes. Because after all my knowledge about uh, the physics, uh, it's a magic that this uh, plane is uh, flying uh, through the air. And I only believe that there are the people in the world who know why it flies, checked this uh, plane, inspected it, uh, and uh, are reacting when something is going wrong because I cannot inspect 
the plane myself. I cannot inspect my car even to the very end myself. So there has to be somebody who is this intermediate. And when we say about the explainability of AI, when we say about the, the, the transparency of the AI solutions, that doesn't mean that all of us have to understand it. But it means that there should be trustful institutions, I would also say public, but maybe even private, yeah, that we can trust as the citizens. I, I, I'd like to ask everyone else, who could these institutions be? Any, any suggestions? How, how do we set this up? And I, may, are you even, would you be interested in, like, being part, uh, in, uh, in being part of that solution? Maybe we could start with you, and I'll give you some time to think up <laughs> of an institutional setup in the meantime. I mean, it depends on what context. I mean, on one hand, I think, I hope no one would disagree that I don't think tech companies should be in charge of any of this. I mean, we will make the technology. We certainly have values that we want to uh, make sure are reflected there and compliant with all laws. And I, I think we're well-intentioned. But in terms of who's in charge, I think that's one way to look at it. I think regulators have a very important role to play, particularly in a democratically elected space of saying what's prohibited and what's not, what's consistent with our values and what's not. And the AI Act reflects a lot of that. When you get to the trusted in institution space, I think it'll be a combination of public and private partnerships, and you're going to have to have those who are more familiar with the technology included in that discussion. But who's setting the boundaries of what's allowed and what's not, that really is a role for governments. I like the image of, of a plane, because we most of us board planes every so often, and, and we really trust that there is a regulator that oversees that you know, everything is being taken care of. So who, who could be the institution who, who act, that acts sort of as a, uh, as a guarantor for, for, for safety? Very delicate question. Um, I think we have examples. Did you address the question to me? Oh. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll give it a try, and then yeah. we have institutions that um, are private, like we talked about journalism, uh, press as the fourth power, um, and and probably no government could do a similar thing, you know. But of course, we also have uh, government-controlled institutions. Um, but they usually have maybe a lot of power, but not too much money. Um, so how to, how to find the right balance, uh, you know, taking uh, companies serious. You talked about the investment of, of Microsoft in AI. I mean, uh, having governments invest that much money is going to be very difficult, you know. So th this balance, I don't know wh where it would strike, but definitely that's a a very, very delicate question to And do we answer. have the know-how? I mean, when we, I, I really like the, the, the image of, of the plane. Do we have, no, this is addressed to you. <laughs> You're not gonna get away with it. Because this, it's not just a question of, of, of money and resources. We, you know, you said there are some institutions, but they don't have money, they don't have the resources. But we need the know-how. If it's a public body that's going to look into AI as, as a tool to, to supervise vicious or bad, malign AI, we need, I mean, we need the expertise and, and the money, obviously. And, and I mean, I can't, even, I can't even think of a body uh, that would be capable of doing it at the moment. Maybe, maybe we've got someone here who's got who's got an idea who it could be. You have one. I you like know? the aviation example because you do have the International Civil Aviation Authority. And I've actually used that reference in the context of the AI Act because it's also you can take this analogy a step further. We. We don't want a situation where a plane would have to be rebuilt in midair when it's taking off from Europe and landing in the US. So standards are important in that space. We would like to see an AI system that is recognized as safe in one jurisdiction to be seen as such in another. Right? So I like the analogy a lot. But you could look at an authority like that. It's much more standards-based, though. Right? You know, That's a little bit of a different situation when we're getting into well, plane crashes are horrible. We want to avoid that at all costs. But we're talking here about elections and democratic values. It's a different type of authority you might have to envision there. Uh, but there is, I think, a lot of validity to the analogy. I just think that the challenge is a little bit different. Not a little bit, quite a bit. Quite a bit. So in this plain example, the liability is also important. Uh, Suicide does not exist for the reason of uh, the catastrophe that happened. 
can I come in? Yeah, I think, I mean, in addition to, to what has been said, I mean, government and democratic society has a leading role there, European Commission, I would say, because, you know, when, when we're facing AI companies, those are very, very big companies, so it's important that we also have the European Commission playing a role. Um, but also research. I mean, everything that we have in democratic societies, a division of power, but then the press you mentioned, research, a very strong education system is, is extremely important. You know, having all these forces in societies that are, that are equipped to face this, that are, that are literate, well-equipped, um, I think that is super important, well-funded research. What we have now is a problem, you pointed that out, that, that the companies totally outperform any public investment in AI and also in AI research uh, with a disproportion that is absolutely striking. So putting more money, not only in creating European companies, but also making sure that, that we have the research in Europe, I think that is, that is very important as well as education. And as far as the, the press is concerned, um, one thing that is concerning me particularly, that is more about social networks and digital platforms in, in terms of communication, that um, our classical or legacy media um, are depending in an increasing and very frightening manner on, on two companies, that's Google and Meta, um, raking in the advertising revenue. So they used to have their own advertising revenue, so they used to be independent, and now they depend increasingly on the advertising money being channeled to them through Google and Meta, who take their share, and that means they need to adapt their content. Um, it's called clickbaiting, that's probably the term everybody knows. They need to adapt their content, and especially their titles, to increase their visibility on social media. So they start responding a little bit to the same mechanism, at least the titles, if they elicit anger and fear, or, or fit into stereotypes that people already have, the revenue is a lot higher. And I think that is something that has nothing, it's not really a technical problem of AI, but it's, it's a power problem. And the problem with AI and digital platforms that the power is concentrated um, among very, very few people. I was on the panel a couple of weeks ago with Kate Crawford from Microsoft, who's a very uh, knowledgeable and important uh, AI expert, and she said, well, you know, these digital technologies, and in particular AI, are basically, if you look at the capital and who really controls the capital, are controlled by 12 to 14 people. 12 to 14 men, it is really such a concentration of power and money has never existed in the world. And this is where we need to look at. I think the point about research is, is vital because I remember during the financial crisis, which is like 15 years ago, we're talking 15 years ago, we found out that there wasn't enough knowledge about how financial markets work, for example. Um, and, and, and I know here in Brussels there was an NGO that was created, but there was always say there is this imbalance, there are the lobbyists, you know, talking to the legislators, to, to the regulators, and there's not enough of a counterbalance from civil society or from, from other parts, because there's just a, a sheer lack of, of knowledge. So do you have any idea what we could do about that? Or would you just agree research is important and, and resources, and where could resources come from? I mean, do you have, do you have any? Do we need to think out of the box? <laughs> you know, like, it's all very hard questions. Well, I think that in, in many areas, um, the roles of uh, public scientific institutions are about to change, you know, because a lot of advancements in, in science are now in fact driven by uh, large companies, you know, uh, but they are of course revenue driven, you know, um, which is fine for economy, you know, um, but um, very naturally, their main focus is not on threats and problems, etc. Their main focus is on how to make more money, which is totally fine. So I think um, public research should, you know, redefine their roles in all this. You know, not to be the the cautious guys, you know, who always try to stop companies from 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 doing uh, their business, but. Um, you know, taking care of, of the risks, taking care of, of uh, the, the things that are dangerous for society. And, and in fact, um, when I look at our uh, um, doctoral school, 
we have so much benefited for eight years from the fact that there are five disciplines involved, that there are 13 uh, different uh, you know, labs involved from three universities. We look at legal aspects, economic aspects, psychology aspects, social aspects, and of course the, the IT aspects. And that's something that public institutions and research institutions can usually do a lot better than companies. You know? So it's maybe a, an issue of redefining the roles of, of public research. And do you think it's being valued? Do, do people actually sort of recognize the value of what you're doing? Yes, yeah. I do think so. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's good. <laughs> that's good already. That's a start. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm hoping for... Thank you. <laughs> I'm picking up my, my buyer. Um, Out-of-the-box solutions. I mean, we've, we've talked about technical solutions. We've talked a lot about um, education has been mentioned. Out-of-the-box solutions. Is there, is there anything else you would like to add to, to the toolbox? Well, that depends what will be the buzzword of the next year. Uh, blockchain had to be, uh, was supposed to be solution for everything. <laughs> Artificial intelligence is now the solution for everything. So let's see what will be the next one. <laughs> uh, what will be the next uh, out of box uh, <laughs> solution that uh, we will try to find for the society. Actually, the problems are always the same. Uh, they, they, we, we have different uh, dimensions, we have different uh, uh, speed of uh, the dangers, but the dangers are uh, more or less the same. Uh, we should first of all try to find out what is going on and what are the reasons for that. For, for me, for example, if we think about the chatbots, uh, one of the biggest uh, find, uh, findings which I made uh, was the fact that the children want to talk with the chatbot for the one and only reason. Chatbot is never bored. Chatbot always have time. <laughs> so if the time and the interest is the most important thing, uh, then we can do something about it. So sometimes the solution lies completely not in the technology, but in understanding how to use the technology. Out of the box solutions, what, what can you think of? Out of the box, I, I don't know. I mean, we talk a lot about kill switches and safety breaks that need to be built into these systems. I think that you might not consider that out of the box. And I actually think sometimes our engineering teams struggle with understanding what that means in practice, right? But I am more optimistic. And I, I think one example that came up earlier, and I know there are a lot of students in the room this evening, when some of this generative AI first came out, it was plagiarism, plagiarism, plagiarism. Educators were really concerned about the way that students were using this to do their homework, to submit essays. And very quickly, we now have AI systems that can be used to detect whether somebody used an AI system to do their homework or write an essay. So, you know, I think there is evidence that this can be part of the solution, but it's a back and forth, it's a back and forth. I think it is very important, and I think it's been recognized by the commission and recognized by the legislators in Europe that there are particular values that we want to protect and maintain here. There's control that we want to maintain over this system, and so long as you have that scrutiny and an awareness of, yes, the opportunity to this, and you described some of it earlier in health and environmental stuff. We're seeing examples almost every week, but a very sober recognition of the risks and some of the limitations. Like you said, I'm never gonna understand uh, an airplane, um, but I'm gonna walk in and trust it because hopefully there's enough scrutiny on that. This is just a little bit different and I think even more, I am optimistic, right? It is more worse when we're talking about things like impacting elections, um, control of citizens and impacts. It reminds me of GDPR language sometimes, but these significant or legal effects, you know, it gets real when it's impacting recruiting decisions or insurance decisions, loan applications, crime, or, you know. I don't know if I have an out of the box solution for you though. How about you? <laughs> Well, really out of the box, um, neither. Um, but I think what I mentioned before about the importance of journalism and the press, I think that is important. And I think we need to make sure in Europe, we and everywhere in the world, but in Europe, we can do something about this, um, that the, the free press will be funded in the future. I, I, I was just on this panel with Maria Ressa. Maria Ressa is a journalist from the Philippines. She's the Peace Nobel Prize laureate from 2021. 
and she worked a lot with Facebook in the beginning to get to get the message out in the Philippines, which had a we had a dictator. And then she realized how the platform turned against her and against her message and in favor of the dictator because of the recommender systems, the targeting systems. And she said to me today, you know, what really is the challenge right now is to save our press because it's going to be dead in a few years. Um, and I, I looked at the numbers a couple of years ago for, for Europe, for several European countries, and you really see the revenue curve, or it's not even a curve, it's a straight line going down for, for the, the, the legacy media, so the classic qualitative journalism, private journalism, and um, the same line going up like that in terms of online revenue for, for Google and Meta. So, and when you talk to the, the publishers, they really say, well, you know, people will go back to subscriptions, and I'm, I don't really see that coming that quickly, at least not quickly enough. So I think that is something we really need to tackle, make sure there's a possibility that online advertising revenue goes back to the publishers who have the content, the really valuable content, um, and that we have a few ideas on how to but do that. I was going to say, how do you do that? <laughs> well, I think it's a combination of two things. Um, the reason why... Um, now advertisers or, or real, uh, rather that the agencies place ads with Google and Meta is that Google and Meta has a data about the people and that is a data protection issue. Um, because when we click away the cookie banner, we say, well, you can all use all the data, Google and Meta can use all the data, and then they use that data um, to place ads basically. And this is how they also work with new sites that they place the ads on, you know, Spiegelstern, whatever. Um, Süddeutsche Zeitung, they're all sort of dependent on that system. Before, advertisers would give the money to the publisher who had the good content because he would want this, the ad be placed um, close to the content. So if you want to advertise something very classical for men, you would probably place it you know, beside a, uh, close to a car or something like that. Um, so all the stereotypes, you know, that's called context-based advertising. What we now have is, is, is targeted advertising based on personal data, so the ad doesn't follow the content, but the person. And as, as one very knowledgeable, Johnny Ryan, who might have heard of, who is an expert on this, says, well, you know, even the reader of FAZ or some very sophisticated uh, daily, there will be a moment in the month where he ends up on porn.com. And there, the ad doesn't cost a euro, but a few cents. Um, so this is the way the, this, this, this uh, universe works right now, and that's very problematic. So one thing we need to do is really to limit the use of, of personal data for advertising, and we need a first step with the Digital Services Act, because at least uh, sensitive data like your religion, your political orientation, your sexual orientation, your health data can't be used for placing in the profile that you use for advertising. Um, the second, so, so that, that is something I think we need to enforce and maybe, maybe to, to reinforce and strengthen in terms of limitations. Um, the second thing we need to do is have an antitrust framework because this advertising system requires a, a very complicated infrastructure for placing these ads. It's, it's a sort of an auction system, real-time bidding for the people who have already heard about this. Um, and Basically, the, on the demand side and on the supply side, there are different kinds of companies. It's, it's very complicated, and they are very often in the hands of the same company, that is Google or Meta. It's the same universe on both sides, and that is you know, inconceivable in any other sector of the economy. And exactly in that sector that is so crucial for our democracy, because it funds our free press, we have this kind of concentration of power. Um, in the US, there are even lawsuits where we see that Google and Meta have been cooperating illegally um, in fixing the prices for the ads uh, to the detriment of publishers. And I think the, the commission is looking into this. Commissioner Vestager has been looking into this. This is a lot of work that has been done behind the scenes, and I think that is a big project for the next legislature for the next mandate to see how we can make a framework that contains antitrust, that makes sure that the publishers really uh, get 
part, at least a good chunk of the advertising money that there can't be um, a total monopoly or an oligopoly of two companies for all this, this advertising, but that we have some real competition um, that makes sure that there's, there's really freedom. McMillan, you were the one who brought up this uh, out-of-the-box <laughs> concept, yeah. so I'm sure you've got a couple of ideas there. Um, no, time, time is advanced, so let me just add one to all the measures that have been proposed, and I, I think we, we need all of them, but one additional one that I can think of is making democracy, uh, democracy um, appear um, more appealing, you know, um, because I think Basically, that's what at stake, democracy and freedom. And um, I think democracy is better than what many people perceive it to be, you know. And it can be even better. So it's about making it better, and it's about also talking about it and, and making sure people understand that it's good. Think of EU, you know, this, this big movement, anti-Europe, you know. Now it has calmed down, but have we done enough to, to really uh, point out the strengths and, and um, opportunities that we have in, in Europe. Have we really benefited from it enough? That's one out of the box. I think thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's a great moment now to open the floor for, for your questions. Uh, I hope we've got a microphone somewhere. Yeah, great. Um, so uh, if, if there are any questions, uh, please be brief and ask to the point. And uh, here, the gentleman here, and if you're so kind as to introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much indeed, the panel, for the very enriching discussion. My name is Wolfgang Papa. I'm working with a think tank here on global governance. That's why I would like to take up your idea of antitrust or competition law. Unfortunately, at global level, we don't have anything of that sort. There was in 1947, when GUT started, a proposal which the American Congress, US Congress, didn't accept at the time. Do you think there is a need for it I personally think there's very much a need for it to have some kind of competition policy. I know there's trilateral uh, Japan, uh, EU, and uh, USA cooperation on some issues, but at the moment, particularly the US is not very strong because they don't want to have their own leaders being involved and being cut down to a certain level to have real competition at, on the world market. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I absolutely do. Um, I think, you know, I'm not an expert of competition law. I sort of stumbled over it working on, on the Digital Services Act. Um, but I, I do think we, we have that, and I've discussed this with economists. Who in the beginning, we're not very aware of how important antitrust legislation now is for preserving democracy. That looked like a very far-fetched thing, but now I think it's absolutely crucial. And, um, you know, the, the thinking that, that still used to be um, dominant is that idea if consumers don't have a disadvantage, it's, it's okay even to have an, a monopoly. Yeah, it's the American approach, but I think some people in DG Comp have also been, you know, don't want to accuse anybody, but it's been quite dominant here as well. Um, and that is something we need to change, and I think we need to look at antitrust legislation as an instrument for preserving democracy. I don't have a, a ready-made solution, but we need to start really looking into it with all the, the, the crowd intelligence and, and you know, all the smart people we have in Europe. And I think the sector where we need to start to do that is really uh, quality journalism and the advertising, the advertising universe, because there it is, it is really very, very obvious, but yeah. I think it's also interesting that in the U.S. when, and you know, I've been, been to the U.S. to discuss uh, the Digital Services Act, um, and what people say there and lawmakers say, well, we might, we will never have, it's so, it's so polarized that it's very difficult to have a piece of legislation to regulate social networks. But what they have been looking in and what they were thought of, of getting was stronger antitrust uh, legislation. And so the thinking in the U.S. is actually going in that direction. Obviously, with the U.S., everything is going to depend on how the November election goes. That's, that's a weak point in that kind of thinking. But, you know, if that goes badly, we should. We have a lot of problems in, in Europe, and we need to take care of ourselves. So I think that's one of the, the many important things we will need to do then. Can I just ask about, about quality journalism? Is that your personal opinion, or, or do you think there is traction in general here in Brussels for, for, for that point within the parliament, within the commission? 
just just to get a feeling for what's ahead, you know, do you, do you think this is something that could be tackled? Well, I, I do think so. I mean, I, I have been making this point for a few years, and when I started making that point, people was like, yeah, no, this is just completely no way. Um, and I started it, you know, in, in politics, you have to have some one strong claim. You can say, well, it could be this, because if you're too nuanced, you don't get anywhere. So I said, well, you want to ban targeted advertising based on personal data. And in the beginning, it was like, what is she talking about? <laughs> And in the end, uh, we discussed this basically every time we discussed the DSA in Parliament, and then I brought it up in panels, and people started discussing it. And now we have this half ban, so you can't use the sensitive data, um, which is a lot more than I expected in the beginning. And in, in the piece in, in, in the law now, you know, uh, it needs, still needs to be enforced. It's not being enforced sufficiently yet, but it will be. Um, so that is a success. At the same time, um, we, we did a study on, on the online uh, advertising environment, which basically said it's bad for publishers, it's bad for advertising, it's just good for do companies, why should we continue to support this in, in Europe? And then the European Commission did a study, a big study that basically says the same things, and there are studies coming up um, from every place, and I know there is some interest to look into that. I mean, there is a feel that there's a need to look into it, what it is going to look like exactly, we don't know yet. It depends on the political majorities, it depends on the commissioners. But I, I think there is a sensitivity, and, and publishers know they don't have a viable business model. They just don't trust us just with the ban to fix it, and this is why the antitrust legislation is so important. Okay, any more questions? All Nemitz from the European Commission. Mrs. Gese, uh, one question. W shouldn't we introduce the good old green principle of polluter pays also in relation to the public sphere? Mm. The representative of Microsoft sits here very comfortably with chat uh, GDP. They have earned billions and billions. While you have described, you know, we're wringing our heads and saying, what are we going to do now? So Microsoft makes the profits, the public uh, has uh, no funds uh, to do something against it. Shouldn't we ask Microsoft to pay for the damage which ChatGPT does in the public sphere now, including the costs to control our students, you know, and the, st uh, you know, I mean, honestly, <laughs> creates a lot of societal costs. It's taken a long time to establish the principle of the polluter pays in, yeah, in, in let's environmental, start. but, but it's, a, it's a very, very interesting point, and it was addressed to you, so we're all eager to hear what you've got to say on that one. Uh, and I'm happy to, but I think he actually addressed it. Yeah, I, I Europe. think so. Okay, <laughs> both, 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 both. Well, <laughs> very difficult to ask a representative of a company to, for higher taxes. So yeah, three, three answers, um, try to be quick. I think, one, the big elephant is the room that we still don't have a good taxation framework that the bigger the company, the more profit they make, the easier it is to have schemes um, that avoid paying taxes, basically. So I think that is something we tried to do that in Europe. There wasn't that much political will. And then there was the OECD initiative to have at least 15%, which I think is still very, very low. I mean, many of us would be happy to just pay 15%. Of taxes, especially, you know, the baker and the library around the corner. Um, so I think the first thing is really to make sure everybody and also the very, very big corporations contribute to the functioning of our, say, of our society in a proportionate way. Um, the second thing is, one thing we did in the Digital Services Act that, I, that was interesting is that we make the companies pay for the oversight. So they pay a small fee that is proportional for the oversight done by the oversight agencies, so the European Commission and the national, um, the national enforcement agencies. That's quite, I think that exists in finance as well, but in the digital sector, we haven't seen it anywhere. And we wanted that to, to have that for the AI Act as well. And there was very hard resistance, if um, I remember correctly, from the far right and from, from EPP, just to call out conservatives, uh, Christian Democrats really did not want that. It was something we, we negotiated on. 
and they absolutely did not want to replicate it. I think we should have that, I agree with you. Just the third point, um, there's a very strong call from uh, civil society organizations dealing with online hate. Online hate, hateful speech is something that um, affects disproportionately certain groups of society, women, people with a migration background, um, the queer community, and it costs enormous amounts of money to these people. You know, you have to stay online. You're, many people have, have um, are affected in terms of their professional uh, performance because they're not well, because they can't be online, because they're targeted with hate all the time, psycho psychological, mental health issues, legal, legal costs, legal costs are spiraling up, really we're skyrocketing. And so there is this, this initiative um, from a series of civil society organizations working on online hate that says, well, the companies who spread that hate and disseminate that hate in a disproportionate way, because you have a lot more online hate, or not more hate online than offline, um, should, should also pay for this. Very difficult to quantify, but I think it's an interesting approach. Happy to, happy to try to respond as well. I, I think two things, one, you know, arguably there already are liability rules in place and fines in place across a number of initiatives that would go very close towards, I think, the concept that you're trying to describe, whether it's in the DSA, whether it's in the GDPR context, whether it's in the DMA context, you have much of that arguably in place, perhaps under a different banner already. Second, if you were to articulate that further, it brings up a lot of questions, obviously, and, you know, happy to discuss it, but, you know, how do you determine that pollution? How do you determine the responsibility? How do you determine all of that? But I would say that a lot of that is in place already with the rules coming out of the commission in particular, um, creating a bit of that disincentive to get it wrong or to have that impact, whether it's a privacy and fundamental rights impact or whether it's a hate speech impact. So I think arguably some of that principle already exists. Okay, lovely. So uh, I think it's time to wrap up. Everybody's gonna get this is starting to get hungry and thirsty. So, so I would love to thank all of my panelists for being here for having this really fruitful debate. And I'm actually quite optimistic <laughs> walking out of this room. And there's just one thing I notice personally is when you when you actually talk to children, they're really aware of what's going on. And, and they're quite alert. Um, I went to a school in, in Belgium last week, and I showed them an example of fake news, and I had so many good ideas about it. I mean, 11 year old saying, I mean, this has been photoshopped. Um, that makes me quite optimistic. And the best news of that day was that we were lo looking at a satirical website. So it wasn't fake news, but it was still a bit of an odd environment. And there was this 11 year old kid, and he said, I'm going to go down to the branch of this bank this afternoon because I want to know why they put their ad there. And I thought, wow, like an 11-year-old kid saying this the bank shouldn't be doing it and I want an explanation. This was an open, you know, like uh, this is not like you could you could say it's a bit it's, it's even remote, but but I thought it was it, it gave me some hope. So, so and, and I think we will need a lot of out-of-the-box thinking, and the, the Commission obviously uh, will have to be active. Um, and, and well, you're, you're doing your job silently in the background anyway, and, and I think you, you're going to be watched. <laughs> you can be sure <laughs> to be watched. And last but not least, I would like to thank the, the interpreters, and I um, wish you a very enjoyable evening. <laughs>